Hello and welcome to the Grand Fast Cave. In this video, we are going to take a look at how we can improve on adventures and maps for role-playing games. This summer, I got my hands on the original adventure module compilation in search of adventure, B1 to B9. And I thought it would be interesting to modernize these for use with modern Dungeons and Dragons, Pathfinder, or even my own Avern Fantasy role-playing game. One of the adventure in module B9, Castle Caldwell and Beyond, has been heavily criticized. I'm not going to pile on on the criticism. I know why this adventure was made and the context. I will instead use it as an example of how you can utilize a couple of simple steps to make an otherwise unremarkable adventure or adventure map much more interesting. Now let's roll initiative and let's get started. As you can see from this map, the layout of Castle Caldwell is rather unimaginative. The map shows that Castle Caldwell has one central corridor that will lead the adventurers all the way around the castle. In total, there are five intersections, but only one of them is interesting. That is the first one, whether you go right or you go left. But even that does not provide a lot of information for the players or meaningful options. The remaining four intersections are not true intersections in that they are just side passages leading into other rooms. Rooms that are actually empty and of no interest. Almost all rooms in Castle Caldwell are lined along this central corridor. In addition, around two thirds of the rooms in Castle Caldwell are empty or use the same repetitive descriptions to convey that the rooms are empty or just full of trash. The remaining rooms have encounters that can be divided into three general groups. The first group are goblins. The second group are human visitors, either in the form of traders or bandits. And the last group are random monsters. As I said, one of the problems with these encounters is that there's no real explanation of how the goblins and the humans coexist in this castle. And while there are a few attempts to give a reason for why some of the random monsters are present in the castle, the reasoning seems vague and unconvincing. Starting with the goblins, you will find these either patrolling the corridor, in room 2 squabbling over some coins, or in room 16 relaxing. These goblins do not really seem to interact in any way with the rest of the inhabitants in Castle Caldwell. The only exception to this are the wolves in room 30, which the goblins in room 16 will unleash upon the party if disturbed. Room 3, 4 and 5 are the residences of three different merchants. They appear to know each other, but we don't know anything about their mutual relation or how they interact, if at all, with the rest of the inhabitants of this area. Just in the same way, we have a group of bandits residing in room 15. There's no telling whether they know the merchants of the previous rooms. And in room 11, there's a cleric. This character is presented as a possible ally, but we don't know either what this character's relationship are with the traitors or the bandits. And finally, we have a smattering of other creatures. In room 10, we have Sturges. In room 14, we have a giant crab spider. And in room 22, we have a giant shrew. Room 24 is remarkable in that we find a dead goblin there and injuries on his forearm telegraph the danger within this room. There's a cobra in hiding. But that's basically it. The rest of the rooms are all empty, with nothing to provide clues for adventurers, except for room 7 that has a magic statue that will only communicate with lawful characters. The statue can answer three simple questions about Castle Caldwell, and that's it. What I propose here are two approaches to making this adventure more interesting. The first approach is a redesigning of the map. I will show that only minor changes can make this much more interesting. The second thing goes into exploring the relationship of these creatures, trying to establish a reason why these creatures are cohabiting this area. This might require giving some thought to the creatures' goals and a possible hierarchy between them. The first thing I did after reading through this adventure was to redraw the map. The redrawing and re the reimagining only took 30 minutes, and this hand-drawn map was the result. This map is fine for me to run this adventure, but I thought it would be fun to recreate this map using Dungeon Scroll. And while doing the remapping in Dungeon Scroll didn't change much about the idea that I had of how I wanted to run this, it actually gave me some inspiration of how to populate and decorate this dungeon. So that was an unexpected boon that I got from using Dungeon Scroll. If you're new to Dungeon Scroll, using this program can be a bit cumbersome, but with a bit of patience, you'll get the hang of it and will not only make your mapping look very good, but it will also make it fun and interesting. This image shows the initial layout of Castle Caldwell. After I had drawn this, I thought of decorating the dungeon with all the furnishings described in the module, and this was the final result. This alone improves the quality of the map significantly in that it allows the GM to access relevant information about the rooms just at a glance. But after quickly doing this, I went back to the original map, and then I started moving things around. As you can see, I 
merge these rooms to create a large room. I merged these rooms because I think Castle Caldwell needed a large dining hall. Another change I did was reducing the size of these rooms. The reason for this is that this central room is an atrium courtyard and I wanted to do something more significant with it than the original design allowed. One thing to keep in mind is that this is the layout of a fantasy castle. Actual medieval castles have many stories and they will not have this sort of layout that resembles more a school or another sort of modern institution. But we'll stick with this layout because the point is actually how do we make this more interesting without changing it fundamentally. I started by knocking down the front door. The castle has been inhabited by various creatures and that would simply not have happened if it had functional front doors that could be closed and locked. In addition, I have added a trap. This is a simple tripwire that will set off an alarm in the complex. Your players will expect this and whether they trigger the alarm or detect it and then disarm it, it will give more credibility to the design of the dungeon. I have made very little changes to room number one. The decorations are basically the same. Broken tables and scattered benches. But since this was imagined as a central gathering hall, I thought a fireplace would make a nice addition. And a group of goblins that were placed in another room, I have moved into this area. With the furnishings provided in here, it is one of the most likely rooms to be inhabited by some of the creatures of Castle Caldwell, and therefore I don't think it, that it should have remained empty. I moved the goblins from room 2 into this area, and instead of having a pile of coins on the floor, which they argue about, I have those piles of coins on a table, and let the goblins argue about them here. In addition, I have drawn a ledge along the southern wall, because while this ledge is present in the original adventure, it makes a lot of sense to have it here because it would allow archers to access the arrow slits overlooking the main approach to the castle. The next room, which was empty except for a bunch of goblins squabbling over coins, I have remade into a stable. It would make sense that one of the first and largest room in the castle was actually a stable for the mounts and beasts of burden of the castle and of visitors. And in addition to adding stalls to this stable, I also moved one of the creatures of this room. The bandits of area 15 had a mule with them and I brought it here. And Yes, the goblins are not going to do anything to the mule because the goblins and the bandits are in cahoots. The way I imagine Castle Caldwell it has been taken over by the bandits and the bandits have recruited the goblins as cheap hired muscle. Going back to room one where the initial goblins were located, you can see that I have added some cobwebs. This is also me telegraphing a future danger to the players. But I will get to that when we reach room 20. As I mentioned earlier, there's a group of goblins patrolling the castle. This patrol is not just aimlessly wandering around all the time. So I have placed them here in this otherwise empty tower Unless the players have encountered the goblins earlier, there's a 50% chance that the four goblins are resting in this room after one of their tours around the castle. And as you can see, I have also drawn a higher ledge in this tower because, again, arrow slits, you have to access them. And instead of the, just having a ledge, I've drawn in a stair that leads up to the ledge. And I've also drawn a stair that leads up to the tower top. I have not made a drawing of those towers, but it would be unreasonable to assume that there are towers without there being a possibility for archers or other defenders to reach the top of the towers and be able to defend the castle from there. And now we come to rooms 3, 4, and 5. These rooms were previously inhabited by traders, one in each room, but I didn't think that made sense. So I have made the central room one more room where the goblins can gather. And the rooms to the sides, I have filled with sleeping mats and pallets for the goblins to have a place to rest. Another good reason to have the goblins here is because the northern door of the central room leads into the atrium where the wolves are. And the way it was before, players might have wandered into the atrium and been attacked by wolves in a way that did not make any sense at all. Now, if the players enter this room and a fight starts with the goblins, the goblins will open the door to the atrium and call in the wolves. And all of a sudden, this encounter both becomes more dangerous, it makes a lot of sense for the players why they're suddenly fighting wolves, and it will be a stark warning to the players that this place is dangerous and there is a measure of organization in place. And now we come to room 7. This is a room with a magic statue that will answer questions. I have changed it so that it will answer the questions of the players regardless of their alignment. And in addition, I have placed a lot of candles in here because what would the goblins think when they come into a room with a speaking statue? They would be at awe at the magic of this place. And I imagine that the goblins would start venerating or worshipping this statue, thinking that it has divine power and maybe that they are able to speak to their god through this statue. And this also makes it more likely that the players will want to investigate this room when they see an empty room with a statue in it. And then we come to the next rooms. These were rooms 8, 9 and 10. These rooms were empty, except for room 10 that housed a small flock of sturges. What I have done here is to collapse the central corridor, making it difficult for players to move around here. It is not an impassable obstacle, since the roof of the corridor has been broken. They would be able to 
clamber over boulders and debris to get to the other side. But it would be more easy to try entering the rooms through barricades that have been erected. These barricades should also serve as a warning to the players. Now, instead of walking into a room and being attacked by Sturgis, they have to make an active choice to bypass a barricade to get it in there. When they get into the room, they find a large dining hall that has been abandoned. In this room, I have also chosen to pull together some of the monsters of Castle Caldwell. I thought it would be fitting to have the three Sturgis here, but also two fire beetles from another room. The reason for this is that the fire beetles are rather unimpressed and will not make for an interesting encounter. But all of a sudden, having to deal with both fire beetles attacking them from below and Sturgis flying above will make the encounter much more interesting. And I think that you can make an argument for the Sturgis not being interested in the beetles since they have hard carapaces and the quality of the fire beetle blood might not interest the Sturgis. Thus, instead of having two rather uninteresting encounters, I have made one interesting combat encounter, combining two different creatures, an environment with large tables and candelabra, and a foreshadowing in the form of this barricade. This is the room of the cleric. I have actually not changed a lot in here, but I have given some consideration to why this cleric would be here. There was no reasoning for this in the original module. It was just a chaotic cleric. In my world, one of the gods that would be most interesting and have represented here would be Krom. So this cleric is actually a priestess of Krom. She's a warrior priestess, but she also venerates Krom as a smithing god. And therefore, I have also thrown in an anvil into this room as a focus for some of her divine rituals. In this setup, she is only very loosely affiliated with the bandits. She was here before the bandits came and has accepted them in the hopes that she might be able to convert them to her faith. On the other hand, the bandits are not very interesting in following anyone other than themselves, but they fear her magic and thus leave her mostly alone. I imagine that the players would be able to leverage the faith of Krum against the bandits. The bandits have, after all, been exposed to this priest's and an intervention by the players might be the last straw to convert some of the bandits. Thus, there could be an interesting dynamic with the players ally with the cleric in order to peacefully deal with some of the bandits. The tower remains empty, but I have also drawn in stairs here like I did with the previous tower. I have moved the traders from room 3, 4 and 5 into rooms 13, 15 and 17. As I see it, these traders are likely the leaders of the bandit group. They make all the planning, they also make all the necessary fencing when they have acquired some merchandise. And while they prefer the goblin or bandit warriors to do all the fighting, they might be able to defend themselves if push comes to shock. I've given them names, since I think it's likely that the players will interact with them. The two of them, they are brothers and very similar in appearance and stature. The last one, the actual leader, is Thanius Manaster, and I have thrown in his wife Vecha Manaster, as well as his dog Groucho. While neither Thanius Manaster or his wife Vecha are very imposing, they might actually be a threat against the players when we throw in a fierce war dog. I expect that the players will have to deal peacefully with uh, Thanius, as he's the key to evicting the brigands and the goblins from Castle Caldwell. Otherwise, I have made no real changes. They are still first level humans, and they will all impose a threat to the party if they are all drawn into one big fight, possibly even including the cleric of Krom, which I have given the name Estrid in my campaign. The followers of Krom are usually northerners, and thus I thought a Scandinavian name would be fitting for this cleric. I have made no real changes to room 19, except that I have drawn in the clutter, and one of those clutter elements that I found in Dungeon Scroll is this cat, which I have drawn on a mattress on the floor. I thought it would be interesting for the players to come in here and realize that there's a cat in here. The cat would of course be able to come in and out through the small windows or arrow slits on the northern wall. I also think that finding this cat here in this way is something that will change the pace of the adventure and give the players reason to pause. The small side way leading to the northwestern tower I have barricaded. The giant crab spider that was previously located in area 14 makes a much more interesting encounter in this tower. I telegraph the danger to the players with the barricades and the cobwebs filling the side corridor and this large room with the changes of elevation and the many cobwebs that hamper movement make a much more interesting encounter. Then we come to room 21. I've made no changes to this. Room 21 is still locked by magic and inaccessible to players. Just as described in the original module, I plan to let the players investigate the dungeon underneath at a later point. And now we come to room 22, the one with the giant shrew. As I interpret this, the giant shrew has made this room its nest. The original module says that there is a crack in the wall, which is how the giant shrew came to be here. But I imagine that the goblins or even the bandits hearing the noise and the commotion that the giant shrew sometimes makes in this room would make them hesitant to enter. So they have blockaded the room with some large crates. Of course, the players would be able to remove these and get into the room. But again, they would be warned that something is going on in there. And then I decorated the last two rooms, the pantry and the kitchen. Having these decorations in place would make it much easier for me to describe the room to the players and even to set up a possible future encounter here. And in the southwest 
Western Tower, I have placed the bandits. These are the bandits that were previously located in room 15. I think it was okay to have them all gathered, resting on makeshift beds or pallets, but I don't think that they should be sleeping with the donkey, which is also why I wanted to include a stable in the castle. And since these are part of the muscle of this bandit group, I thought it would be good to have them close to where the entrance was. That way they can respond if a fight starts, or they would even be able to keep watch from the arrow slits, which they can reach from the ledge above. Again, I have made no real changes to the bandits. These are just level 1 brigands and are likely going to be a suitable challenge for the players if they want to fight them. And then I went back to the room with the shrew because there was something wrong with it. I wasn't really satisfied with it there. And then looking at dungeon scroll, I found these toilets, old medieval toilets. And of course, instead of just being a crack there, this room was the castle latrine. There are toilets here, washing basins, and also a large nest that the shrew has made for itself. And when the giant shrew has to enter or exit its nest, it uses the castle latrines. If the players enter this room during the night, they will find the room empty, as the giant shrew is nocturnal and will be out hunting. But if they come in here during the day, the shrew is here resting and will defend its nest from the players. In addition, if the players come here during the night and anyone wants to use the toilets, there's a 100% chance that the shrew will return to a random toilet. And if that random toilet is the one being used by a player, it's going to make for a painful experience. And now we come to the rooms north of the atrium. I have made the entrance to the atrium from this side of the castle more interesting with a hall of columns that lead into the atrium through an open archway. The rooms to the sides are also filled with clutter, but the easternmost one I have filled with implements for weaving and a loom, again inspired by the clutter in Dungeon Scroll. And I have added one more cat. Aside from a small skylight, there's no real way for the cat to get out of here, so I imagine that it's trapped and hungry, so it will beg the players for food and will try to escape the room when the players leave it. And it's not only the northern room that has some columns. Now I have added some columns to the atrium as well. And imagine that the eastern and western sides of the atrium garden are covered with tiles and a small roof. And at the same time, I have added a fountain to the middle of the atrium garden. This makes this area more interesting to investigate, but also more interesting if a fight breaks out here. And to finish off the last four rooms, which were just empty rooms with an old bed, I have now populated with zombies. These were driven in here a long time ago by the cleric and have remained undisturbed. I imagine that any time one of the zombies is disturbed, then there is a risk that other zombies will be drawn into the atrium as they smash through the doors. Even while I haven't totally redrawn the map of this adventure, I think that I have improved on its quality by establishing relationships between the inhabitants of Castle Caldwell, and also made it more interesting by blocking up the corridor and adding in some barricades here and there that foreshadow some of the threats in this place. Also barricades that make this place much more inhabitable for the bandits there. I hope you found this walkthrough of Castle Caldwell interesting, and that some of the ideas and steps that I have applied here are something you are going to try out yourself. My point is, that even when you have a very uninspiring dungeon map, an adventure that does not make a lot of sense in a modern narrative, you can still do a lot to improve on it and make it quite usable in a modern game. If you enjoyed the content of this video and have not done so already, please consider subscribing and pressing the notification bell and leave a like. Also leave a comment. Are there any ideas in this video that you particularly liked? Or are there other ideas that you think I missed? Until next time, keep playing. The bandits have the bandits have been exposed to this priest's proletization.